The following thoughts on Happy Hour do not represent Cox Media Group or its sponsoring. Anything you hear may and will be used against you. Thank you. Call security! What's up? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And on the phone line is a guy that I grew up listening to from the Anthony Cumia show on the Compound Media Network. Anthony Cumia is on Hoppy Hour. What's up, man? Thank you, Ryan. How uh, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good, dude. Like it's crazy because I heard you guys when you first came on Free FM in Chicago, and that was like in '06. Oh, and wow. it's crazy now that in 2017 I'm in my small apartment in Tampa Bay and I'm talking to you. It's crazy. <laughs> it is strange how uh, stuff turns out, isn't it? All of a sudden you're like, oh, and now it's this. That's cool. I'm glad you. Uh I'm glad you listened. I remember that uh, being in Chicago for uh, for a while, and then going there to do some gigs. It was nuts. Chicago was. We had some crazy, uh, crazy appearances there. Nothing beat when you would go up against Mancow. Like when you called into Mancow's show, that was some of the best radio I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. It was so ridiculous when I yeah I made a call once. It was supposed to be a prank, and I ended up just making a good call to his show. <laughs> <laughs> what it is. That's what I like about you, man, is you keep it real. Throughout your time in radio, you've never said you were sorry, and you've just been very honest. And there's times I've been like, wow, what Anthony just said is completely wrong, but I keep listening because you make very good points. <laughs> yeah, at some point, you know, you got to just, uh, you know, I guess be as honest as you can. You know, I know there are plenty of opinions I have that people find repulsive. But, uh, you know, that's who I am. I think there's, there's certain people that go out there and you just know their, uh, their BS and everybody and, um, it, it just doing things or saying things to, to further their career or something. I'd rather just be honest, man. My life's already always been a, an open book. So, you know, I really don't care about talking about anything as uh, openly as I can. So some people find it repulsive. Some people get pissed, whatever. But, uh, it's really all I know how to do at this point. Isn't it crazy how the listeners, let's say on good old Twitter, just get really into our lives? Like, I'm very small when it comes to being a podcast. I'm not as big as you or other podcasts. But isn't it crazy how they just dig into our lives and take every single word into account? Everything. Everything, first of all, is taken taking completely literally also at face value. Uh, if you make a joke, people will think you're deadly serious about it. And, uh, yeah, and, and people, there's a lot of people out there that will just constantly try to get you in trouble, which I never understood that either. It's like, oh, you did this, let me report it to the proper authorities. It's like, oh, get a life, relax, whatever. But, uh, yeah, people feel like they just want to want to get in there and find out what makes you tick. I don't know what that's all about, but I've been used to it many years. <laughs> Well, it seems like you've had to fight against it a lot when it came to the uh, league getting mad at you guys for sex for Sam or all the times that the media has tried to throw you guys under the bus. It just seems like people get too uptight over words or radio bits. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I thought it was bad back then when we got uh, when we got booed for things like sex for Sam in the church and um, been, being, being taken out of context saying things. But it's even worse now. Like now there's people waiting for you to trip up and say the wrong thing and try their best to uh, have your, your career taken away. I don't know where that comes from. It's uh, Words definitely seem to carry more weight than even actions these days. If you do something bad, people are willing to try to find an excuse for it. If you say something they deem bad, uh, boy, they want you wiped off the face of the earth. I was watching one of your rants on uh, YouTube. It was the one about famous people making videos trying to be preachy about the election. And, dude, you were spot on. I don't care about the election either way, but I hate seeing the liberal people out there in Los Angeles trying to shove it down our throat, you know? Oh, yeah, they have this... Um, it, it really, for years, there was this plausible deniability on the part of the left where they were just like, no, the our opinion, and... We try not to be partisan, but I'm doing this and that. And and this past election, they just said, no, this is what it is. We are so in the Democratic camp, the Hillary's camp, the liberal. And to, to think that somebody that has a career in Hollywood, and a pretty good one, has any 
relatability to the regular Joe walking around this country is so ridiculous. That, that the likes of Barbara Streisand <laughs> is going to tell somebody how they should uh, uh, determine what they're going to do for a living or uh, how they should speak in public. And do, it's so outrageous. I'm glad that uh, a lot of people started seeing that and. Um, not giving these celebrities the credence they, they used to and that they think they deserve. Ugh. What I hate too is when they'll say something very outspoken about the news or about Trump and then they say they're sorry two days later. It's like you said it because you were being honest. Shut up. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, the least honest thing you'll ever hear is a sincere apology. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't happen. Somebody, especially because they get in trouble for saying certain things and the more passionate you sound about what you're saying, the more trouble you'll be in. So if you really meant something and you get in trouble for it, just saying you're sorry doesn't mean anything. You you said it, you meant it, it was obvious. Um, but then they go around on their little talk show apology circuit and TMZ and, and everything else. And people are supposed to just go, oh, okay. I'd have more respect if you just said, well, that's just how I feel. You ask me. That's another thing I don't understand. A lot of times people in the media will ask somebody something. Hey, how do you feel about this? And they'll give an honest answer because they were asked. They weren't just out on a soapbox yelling this. They were asked. And then the person they got gave the answer to will then write about it and try to get them screwed for it. Like, well, you asked me. And I gave you an honest opinion. I'm not allowed to have uh, an honest opinion on controversial uh, topics these days. It's, it's gotten insane. What I like, too, is you're very outspoken when it comes to the crime in Chicago. I'm from Chicago. You were heard in Chicago. Yeah. You know how great of a town it is. But it's just kind of sad to see that there's this new perception that it's an awful city when it's one of the best places in this whole continent, you know? Yeah, it's. Uh, I love Chicago. It's a great place. Uh, it has its areas, much like, and, and <laughs> Chicago, actually, it's a relatively small area that gets all that news about uh, uh, shootings and whatnot. The rest of the city is fucking, it's amazing. It's a great city. Uh, but, you know, it's going to have that reputation until something gets done and, uh, you know, some, some real uh, law enforcement can get in there and enforce laws that are already in place and uh, make people feel safe. It's just crazy, man, because it's like people just seem to see what the media says and they just take everything in. It's like having an honest opinion isn't there anymore. What the media says is what people think is true now. It's very sad. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Well, that's why, thank God, people are starting to see through that whole thing. The, all, the only thing we had was mainstream media for years to tell us, the news, you know, hey, what's going on here? And we trusted them, and the only thing they had was that trust. Like, why would you believe anyone that's telling you something unless you trusted them? So they have this built-in trust factor, and over the course of the past couple of years, they have just lost that. I mean, people do not believe what they hear on the news anymore. So there are plenty of other outlets for people to get their information, disseminate it, make their own decisions on... Uh, and, and get their own opinions based on what they're reading. I kind of like that better, to tell you the truth. I don't like that there was this all-knowing news that would have to tell everybody what was going on and how you should feel about it. Uh, but in this kind of mid-period we're at where things are switching over, there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of dishonesty, and, and the old-school news is uh, feeling that they're losing something. So they're fighting back to get... Uh, their audience back but uh, I think the future really is alternative media where uh, people can, can listen to real people speaking about the news and make their own opinions it's uh, quite the exciting time here's what I've wanted to know about any radio host that might be a bit controversial or a quote unquote shock jock how weird is it to see the media reporting about you and being very unfair and leaving parts out like whenever you and Opie did your things back in the day and the news would be very against you guys how weird was it reading all the hatred from the major news networks uh, that is uh, that is a strange occurrence when that happens uh, especially you know I, I came out of a blue collar job I, I worked for a living and then got into radio so to then all of a sudden read about you or see yourself on the news 
uh, being talked about by these experts and, and they're just lambasting you. It's one of the oddest things you can ever go through in life. Uh, but another thing uh, you realize uh, early on, at that point, years ago, I already was hit to this fake news thing. Um, I, I don't think there was ever, there's ever been a story about myself or Opie or the Opie and Anthony show that was ever accurate. I, I, we would have to judge it on who got like kind of the most things right because so much disinformation and just poor reporting, speculation, rumor, innuendo would go into a story and you're sitting there going, look, I'm the guy. I'm the best judge of what just happened here and you got it completely wrong and you're at their mercy because especially at the time, there was no recourse. You couldn't go somewhere else and get that kind of coverage. So you just sat there and took the crap and uh, you were the guy they were talking about on the news, regardless if they were uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. So now I grew up listening to you and I heard you guys get into all those radio wars back in the day. And what I loved is they would pretend that they knew nothing about your show, but then they would rip into everything in your show. So they've obviously heard it. That's what used to crack me up back in the day with all those local shock jocks and all those markets. They would try to begin shit, but they knew everything about you guys. Yeah, that's another thing from old school radio. There's so many things that people did and still do, which is kind of weird from uh, old school. The the rule of thumb that a program director would tell their honored air personality is if you're big in the market and someone that isn't as big as you mentions you, ignore them. And I never thought that was a good thing. I love the idea of battling it out, having some fun and goofing on people. It's such an easy thing to do. A lot of radio people are just very insecure, and it's uh, it's easy to kind of get them going. So it, it was always fun to do that and really battle, and we never kind of played by the, the program director rules. So if we got in a battle with anybody on the air in those old shock jock battling DJ and stations uh, days, we would just pull out the howitzer. Someone shoots a, a spitball, just nuke them, you know? And it was always... Um, very surprised if people would ask why are you being so mean it's like well we just end it we we go for the quick victory and uh, it seemed to work over the years we did pretty well in those uh, wacky uh, radio battles which one is the one that comes to your mind the most is it the one with man cow or some of the other local morning shows which radio battle do you think about the one that got the most intense I guess the one with, of course, the Howard thing was huge because it was Howard. And, you know, he's like the biggest uh, the biggest uh, fish in the sea there. Um, so having those, but unfortunately, a lot of those uh, culminated off the air uh, with management and bosses yelling that we couldn't talk about him and uh, him making gag rules and whatnot. So um, we had a little fun with that. But uh, I guess, yeah, the man cow thing was pretty big. Uh, the Bubba, uh, the Love Sponge thing uh, was a pretty good one, too. And then there was that one guy. Oh, what the hell was his name? I think it's Philly. God, uh, there have been so many names. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think Van Cow, though. Yeah, yeah, we, we did a lot of goofing uh, back and forth with him. You know what's weird about these morning shows that are just on in their markets is that they think they're like the top of the game and they're like famous just in that city. But once they leave that town, nobody knows who they are. It's the most bizarre ego being a local famous person, you know? <laughs> one market wonders. Yeah, they uh, they really, they're the kings in their little small town uh they could probably go to any local bar and never buy a drink. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that's got to get you when you leave your town and realize um, no one knows who the hell you are. You've made zero impact. <laughs> uh, yeah, some people are happy with that, which that's fine, but you should not walk around with um, any kind of ego saying that you've conquered the uh, broadcasting world if you're a, a one-market wonder, you know? Is it weird to think about the impact you and Opie had in radio, especially with comedy, all the comedians that came through your show over the years? Is it ever weird to think about? Yeah, again, I'm not, I've always been a, uh, you know, I'll look at 20 other reasons why something happened um, aside from 
my own actions. So I, I really don't do a lot of um, back tapping, as it were. But the truth of the matter is, when it comes to comics and radio, I mean, comedians have been going on radio forever, but they go on, they do a little of their act, uh, the DJ would plug their gig, and that was it. Like, the ONA show was one of the first shows to just have comics come on as people. And, you know, forget about your act. Throw that out the door. We're going to talk about this or that or whatever the subject would be. Or we're going to goof on each other. Like, that whole thing, and I know Jim Norton was such an important part of bringing that to our show. Uh, and it became a huge thing where um, some of, some of the, the biggest comics out there uh, came through our show as just, you know, your local comic and, and are doing very well um, even today. So, yeah, I, I feel pretty good about that. I feel good that we were we were part of that. Now, I'm doing this show from my house. I do pretty well. I have listeners from when I worked on Rover Show. I have listeners here. What I want to ask you isn't just for me, but it's for anybody that's trying to build something at home where you can make money. What is the key to gaining traction when it comes to having a show from your house? My favorite, I've said this so many times, and it's my favorite thing I've ever heard uh, on this topic, and it was said by Adam Carolla. He said, uh, the first thing you have to do, be famous. Because <laughs> it's like, if, if you have some notoriety, it's a lot easier to get an audience together uh, pretty quick. Uh, aside from that, I think anybody that wants to do a podcast, especially today when everyone has a podcast, you have to stand out. You have to be fearless. Uh, there will be people that will just lambast you for some things you're saying. And I don't even mean be phony and get on and say things outrageous uh, on purpose, but pick something you're passionate about, and then uh, and it's got to be interesting to people, but then talk about it, how passionately you are about it. Uh, if you start covering up a little or backing off uh, instead of going to the limit with, with what you want to say, uh, it's going to come off as half-assed, and... Um, you're going to be apologetic and things. That you got to go 100%. That's what it is. Don't worry about what anyone thinks or says or, or calls you. You just got to go balls out. How awesome and how freeing is it doing the show from your house? I mean, there's just something that's real fun about the idea that you can just go to your basement or for me, go to my living room and just record a show. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I did that. I did that. The house thing, the basement thing, for a year, and then the past two and a half or a uh, year and a half, uh, I got a studio in the city. So I'm I'm doing it from um, Midtown Manhattan now. It's it's great. It's you know it's been uh, obviously more people are available in New York City. It's a lot harder to get uh, Jimmy or Bobby or or you know DePaulo to hump out to uh, Roslyn, Long Island. Uh, than it is to get them to come into Midtown, which they're in there probably every day anyway. So it just made it easier for that. It's dedicated 100% to the shows, and with more shows joining the network, it would be a little odd to have people traipsing in and out of my house every day at various times of the day. Um, so getting a studio finally was uh, the best answer. But for that year, man, that was my lifeboat. I needed a place to broadcast from. I had had the studio set up from doing uh, my Live from the Compound show, uh, even when I was with Sirius XM, and uh, I did it just because I liked it. That was, I completely enjoyed the medium of having a, a visual program that I could play clips on and talk about. Uh, if something pops up in the news at 9 p.m., I could run downstairs and throw it on and, uh, and, and start talking about it. So just the chance that I had that down there helped me hugely when I got the boot. Uh, for the year after, it was great. Uh, I had people coming by, guests and whatnot, but it worked out where the studio was pretty uh, key. Also, I needed some kind of structure. I will sit on my couch, watch TV and play video games, unless booted out of my house to go somewhere on a daily basis. And uh, <laughs> to have to go to the city and do a show, it's something, it kind of works out that it gives me a bit of a ritual um, every day. <laughs> 
You worked with Opie for 19 years. How was it going from having a co-host for 19 years to having to build your own show on your own? Was it kind of an adventure, or were you a bit anxious about it? Uh, definitely both. Definitely both. It was, um, I, I, like I said, I had been doing the Live from the Compound shows on and off, even when I was on, on the XM with Opie. So I, I knew what I wanted to do as a kind of single guy hosting a show. Um, it wasn't that uh, scary of a thing. Um, but now that it was my job, it definitely got me a little anxious. Like, can I pull this off uh, as a goof downstairs in my basement? It's fine. Uh, but, but for this now being the next part of my career, yeah, I was a little apprehensive if I would be able to pull it off. But I've always been able to just you know, get on and, and talk about whatever topic comes up. Um, that's like, I guess, part of whatever talent I have. I could yap about anything. Uh, so that was kind of nice. And then I have the right people in place uh, that help out um, with the shows. And then the new shows coming on board open up uh, possibilities to to have people come on every so often. Pat uh, Dixon and, and Gar uh, Gavin McGinnis are so good to have come on and do crossovers with me on the show. So I, I definitely like carrying the show myself sometimes, uh, doing, doing the two hours solo. But, um, you know, having, having a, a, a sort of a guest host or even just a guest uh, for the day is cool, mm -hmm. too. So, yeah, it was a little apprehensive at first, but I'm so used to it now. Uh, I, it, I don't even give it a second thought when the camera goes on and it's time to do the show that, you know, I'm like, oh, I got to talk. You know, it's just, it's second nature. Now, you do a show for two hours every day. How do you find prep to fill the time? Because I do my show maybe once or twice a week, and I have a hard time when it's a slow news day finding things to talk about. So how do you find prep for your show? Uh, I, I, I'm a kind of guy, and I've been like this my whole life. I will turn on the television and get pissed off at a commercial, and that'll become a break. Like I, anything I look at, uh, can probably become a break if I think about it enough. But some things just pop and go, I go, God, I want to talk about that. Cause, and I feel inside me, I'm like, ugh, that annoys me. And I know if I'm that like passionate about it, even in a goofy way that a commercial's annoying me, like, like really, who cares? But if it's working up a phlegm in my throat, then I know I could unload on it on the air and, and people find it entertaining. Or, you know, or I hope they will. Uh, other things like, when I'm leaving the show Thursday, which is the last show of the week that we do, I'm on the train. I'm cutting and pasting links from news stories for Monday already. Like I'm looking at the whole, the second I get off doing my show, I'm looking for at least the next day's show, if not uh, Monday's show, if it's a weekend. So, I mean, I'm never not looking for material. And, um, you know, that's, that's the most important thing, to just keep your eyes and ears open for anything. Um, put down stories you might not even know that you're going to talk about. Uh, or if there's something that's kind of interesting, and if you put your own twist on it, it becomes very um, relatable to the audience, or they'll understand why you're talking about it because you're doing it in your own way. Like, sometimes prep doesn't just smack you in the face and go, hey, this is a great... Uh, subjects. Some of those things are great. Anytime a teacher has sex with a student, it's a story. Yes. I love it. It's going <laughs> on the show that day. It's it's easy. But there are other stories that you look at and kind of go, is it? But then you kind of think about it, put your own twist on it, and it becomes good too. So sometimes you got to look a little deeper than just, is this a funny, wacky story? And, and think how you can put your own personality onto it and make it a, make it a break for the show. Why do you think these teachers aren't learning their lesson and they keep having sex with the kids and the, and the teenagers? I mean, it's weird, dude. I've talked about this on my show. I think it's porn making it such a prevalent thing when you go on the homepage of Pornhub and you see teacher kid sex that I think it's just become very taboo in 2017. It's very bizarre to watch. It's a strange... I was trying to explain this the other day also with Keith and a couple of the other guys. Uh, about why this seems so prevalent now. I think it's an age thing. I, I don't remember, especially when I was growing up back in the, the 1800s, when, uh, when teachers, they were old. They were older ladies. 
I don't know what it is now that younger girls are are getting to be teachers, girls in their 20s. So that's one thing. The other thing, we never spoke to a teacher unless it was in class. These guys, now they have, like, the teacher's phone number. They text them shit and email, like, hey, uh, you know, was this assignment? We never had communication with a teacher outside of that classroom. just didn't happen. So it gives the opportunity to maybe slip a funny line in or, you know, develop your personality a little more. Maybe the teacher is telling how unhappy she is in certain circumstances. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you, a lot of guys are screwing their teachers. And it's uh, it's not exactly uh, girls that look to be hard up either. There's some attractive ladies that uh, get pounded by their students. Isn't it weird? I'm not saying that it's as bad when a guy bangs a girl, but it just seems like we sort of praise these female teachers and we go, oh, good for the guy. But whenever a guy bangs a teenage girl, we go, ew, what the fuck? Do you know what I mean? Put them away, yeah, put them away forever. Yeah, there's a criteria there. There's a, it, it, the teacher, the girl teacher is really attractive. Uh, John will pop the picture up on my monitor and I'll go, yep, yeah, not guilty. She's going to walk. It, it just doesn't matter. If she's a, a real uh, disaster, then, you, you know, you'll give her a couple of years maybe in the joint. And if it's a guy in his uh, 30s and uh, he's uh, been with a student, um, yeah, then it's like lock him up, throw away the key, uh, sterilize him, you know, all that. So, oh, double standard. There's double standards all over the world. I defy you to read any story in 2017 and not be able to come up with a double standard for it. Now, what I want to ask you, too, is kids my age, we have it easy. We can get laid just by going on a mobile app. Well, you back in the day, you had to work for it and actually talk to girls in person. Is there a part of you now that wishes you had that back in the day so you could have got laid more? <laughs> yeah, I think any guy would think um, any guy uh, that grew up in the uh, 70s or 80s uh, would think, my God, wouldn't an app uh, have been nice, a dating app or something, or even just uh, social media to just kind of scope out your prospects before you actually had to even come up with a conversation. Uh, back in my old days, oh my God, I'm talking initially cold out of nowhere you're face to face now now you have to juggle do something show your plumage bird make this girl want you and and uh it was it was not an easy thing and and rejection was its coldest because it was right there in front of the person and usually in front of your dumb friends who would see you crash and burn miserably and make fun of you so while there's a uh, kind of a fun nostalgia about the whole thing, hell yeah, every guy would have liked it a little easier, <laughs> uh, like like it is now. Who wants to go through that aggravation? <laughs> Now, I work at 1025 The Bone. It's like FM Talk Radio, and one of the shows on there is Roger and JP, and I've been on their show a few times, and JP wanted to make sure that I said what's up to you. I, oh, my God. I love JP, man. I've known that guy forever, back in the BAB days, and because, uh, you know, him and Opie were friends and coworkers, and uh, to me... When I was still working for a living in construction, uh, JP was the epitome of radio voice. Like, that was the voice, man. Just deep, smooth voice, great delivery, articulate. And, uh, yeah, to me, that was what you had to be. And then I realized you could just be a jack-off like me. So <laughs> <laughs> it worked. It, I guess it all worked out. <laughs> Now, for people that haven't heard your show, why should they sign up for the Anthony Cumia show and the Compound Media Network? Oh, well, you know what? It's, um, it's a whole different animal. Uh, it's, it's a new type of medium. Um, you're going to hear genuine, open, and honest talk. You talk about uh, the First Amendment. There's no strings attached here. Uh, no one could tell anybody that they can or can't say what they want on this uh, network. And um, it's it's something that really is taken for granted these days. Uh, we got personalities on there uh, like Gavin and Pat and um, 
uh, Gino and Aaron, uh, the crazy Eastside Dave McDonald, um, Talit Stark, like a bunch of different political ideology, but also a lot of comedy, and again, that complete lack of fear. Uh, so if something comes to your head, uh, before you have to run it through a mouth filter, it could just pop out, you know? And I think you get a much more honest, uh, you get a much more honest show that way when you're not worried uh, when that mouth filter is in place with uh, thinking about a GM and a PD and the advertisers and all that. So it's um, it's just a much more honest, real type of broadcast you're going to get. How awesome is it not having to deal with any bosses? You know, I, I've been very good over the years with dealing with bosses. Opie was usually the bad one that had a problem dealing. We would go in there and good cop, bad cop the guys uh, constantly. Um, but I, I would get along with management pretty well just because I would shine them on and, and be like, hey, as long as things are status quo and I'm getting my check and I'm able to do the show, everything's cool. Um, but I never realized until I didn't have a true boss uh, how obtrusive they were in uh, or intrusive <laughs> they were in uh, in the show I mean you're constantly checking yourself to not get them mad or get yourself in trouble and uh, it is detrimental man. you really you, you don't realize how much stuff you didn't say or won't say that would have been funny or informative or interesting because you're worried about that management cloud that's uh, over your head it's uh it's been a whole new experience. I, I couldn't be happier. There are fans, Anthony, that would love to know this. Is there any chance in the future that you would work with Opie? Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I meant Roger, not JP. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that, too. When I heard you say deep voice. JP. It was Roger. Yeah, it was Roger. It was Roger. But, but, but JP, come on. I like you, too. <laughs> no, Roger Luth. <laughs> oh, poor JP. He's like, oh. Damn it. <laughs> no, Roger Lewis is the friggin' radio guy. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Uh, but <laughs> uh, what was the question, sir? Would you ever work with Opie again? Because a lot of fans ask all the time, I'm assuming, if you would ever work with him. Oh yeah, in some capacity. I mean, like I tell people all the time, look, the ONA show thing was uh, was what it was and it was great and it's it's done. I mean, uh, it ran its course. Um, you could look back fondly. Uh, it's one thing, but uh, we could definitely do something in some capacity. I'm certain of that. Uh, but to tell you the truth, uh, we couldn't do the O and A show again. So, uh, yeah. But I would, I would, I would definitely consider if the project was right, uh, something like that. Definitely, I'd work with them again. What was it like when you called Opie show or you guys were on the phone for the first time about six months ago? How weird was it where that magic was just back like that? You know, it's strange. It was weird for like a second because it was like, oh, you should. Here's, you know, this is Opie on the line. We haven't talked in that. But the second we started talking about stuff, uh, it just naturally fell right into place. I mean, there's no denying that when we start yapping about whatever the hell we're going to be talking about, uh, something happens, you know? It's it, it's something um, very natural, uh, and people over the years have seemed to enjoy it. So, you know, that's still there. But, uh, well, like I said, we couldn't recreate the ONA show, but there's definitely opportunity for us to work together in some capacity and put out something that I think uh, would be really, really good. So, um, you know, that's open. Now, for people that would want to hear your show, where can they find your work? Ah, uh, that is at uh, compoundmedia.com. Uh, Compound Media. Yeah, I'm on from uh, 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, and that's uh, Monday through Thursday. But then we got, like I said, we got a lot of new shows on there that are uh, really doing well and uh, are very, uh, very interesting and completely 100% uncensored so uh, it, it's been a lot of fun to do and, and people uh, people enjoy it so I'm, I'm really psyched about it. Well Anthony keep up the good work man. You're one of the reasons why I'm in radio. I've listened to you for about 11 years now so it's been a lot of fun having you on Happy Hour. 
That's so cool, man, Ryan. Thanks a lot. I uh, like I said, I follow you on Twitter. You get some uh, funny and interesting tweets uh, uh, going on, and um, I appreciate. It. I appreciate you uh, having me on. Very cool. Thank you, Anthony. Keep up the good work. Thanks, man. Take it easy. All right. Bye. I can't even believe that just really happened because what I am doing right now is I'm sitting on my couch in my apartment in South St. Pete in kind of a sketchy part of town and I just had the influence that caused me to go into this crazy business on my show. This is very surreal. I've had about 150 guests, and I'm not even bragging. I'm just saying how many I've had. I've had 150, and that was probably the one where that didn't even seem like real life. Like That's going to be an interview that I'm going to have to take in for a few minutes. That was very surreal. Now, if you're a fan of Anthony Cumia or the Opie and Anthony show, and you want to hear my show, and you're drawn in by the potential... Get the Hoppy Radio app in the Google Play and iPhone shop. I have my own mobile app like Anthony, like XM Radio, like Sirius XM. So you can listen to me anywhere. I do the shows live. And it's weird because I do the shows on occasion. It depends on my work schedule because I work in promotions at 102.5 The Bone. But get the Hoppy Radio app and you can listen anytime, anywhere. And I post when I'm going to be live on the Twitter app at Ryan Hoppy Radio, RyanHoppyRadio.com. All right, this has been Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy, saying peace out. Happy Hour. Happy Hour.